Welcome to Fruitman Road Church here in Springfield, Missouri. I'm Dan Masters, the pastor. I'm glad that you could join us this morning. I know many of you are still cooped up with COVID. We've had new people in our church uh, get come down with it, but we're still we're still meeting and we're also broadcasting these. So I pray that they'll meet your needs as you go along. This morning, our text is going to be found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we'll also be being uh, drawn from uh, Titus chapter 2 and from Acts chapter 6 a little bit. But our major text is, is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. The Baptist Faith and Message, which is the Southern Baptist Convention's book on theological guidelines, says that there are two offices of leadership in the local church, elders and deacons. Now, that's generally true in all denomination churches, although they may be strung out on various levels of service and degrees of authoritative power. For example, you may have deacons at one area that uh, are at, like they're beginning in a particular area of authority and then they move to another area uh, like that. Or you can just have just straight out deacons who have one major uh, job to do in the church. As I said, our text is found here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 where it lists the qualifications of the deacons more than any other place. Let me pray with you and we're going to move forward. Father, I pray that you'll bless us this morning as we look into your word, as we study what it means to be part of a local church and what it means to have the authority or the servants involved in that church so that we might recognize them for who they are and that we might find our place among them. Bless us to this end, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. Welcome. We want to begin with the role of the deacon. The word deacon, D-A-C-O-N, is actually a transliteration. It's not a translation. You know, for example, baptism. Baptizo was the original Greek word, but they didn't get rid of that. And the, the, the way you interpret that is to immerse. But because of some political things in the past, they simply transliterated to the, made an English word out of it, baptism. The same thing is true here with deacon. Deacon is a transliteration of the Greek verb diakonos, which itself comes from two Greek uh, terms, one dia, which means through, and the other konos, which means the dust. Now, when you hear that, you rec recognize, obviously, that it's a reference to something that involves a great deal of humility. Not something that's lifted up, but something that is humble and comes from a heart, a willing to serve willing, uh, without any pay, any gain. It's literally translated in English as a servant or a minister. So when we use the word deacon, we are using a Greek term that means a servant or a minister. Perhaps the closest understanding we have of this task might be, uh, is used in other Greek literature to mean one who waits on tables, whether they are tables in a, uh, like in a restaurant or a home or tables that have to do with uh, administration, uh, taking care of money, those kind of things. But it means one who is a waiter on tables. For example, if you think of a waiter in a restaurant today, what does the waiter do? Well, he uses, and I use the term he here because you'll see that mostly used in the deacons, but he sees to a diner's needs. When I go in to eat at a place, the deacon normally meets me, has me seated. I come over, he provides the silverware, he provides napkins, or he provides a drink, asks what we're going to drink and all that. Then he takes our orders, what we want, and he takes back, he's the one who brings the food to us. And all the while during the food, he checks on us to see how it's going, how the feed's doing, does he need to, to refill our drink, all those kind of things, whatever it is. It is his task to make sure that we're satisfied with our, our dining opportunity. In all of this, if he's a good waiter, he is polite and eager to satisfy. Now, take that all the way back, that, that story, that uh, illustration, all the way back to the first century and figure it this way. Everything we do today is, is uh, easy to do because we do so many things that, are, that we've uh, worked out other ways to do it more easily. But in the first century, imagine doubling that work around a table, having to run quickly to go get food, move back, all that kind of thing, without any, any expectation of gain. That is, you're not going to, to get any kind of a tip for doing this. And with even a more humble and generous attitude, you're talking about someone who is a servant or a slave in a home. They're waiting on the table. Now, that's an accurate description, but it also includes all kinds of works, not just work around the table. 
It is believed by biblical scholars that the first mention of such an office in the church is in Acts chapter 6, where the issue of mistreatment between one group of Jewish widows, the Hellenistic group, those were the group that spoke the Greek and they came out of a different background, from the Hadistic group, and those were the, the Greeks who spoke Aramaic or Hebrew, and they were from that area, uh, had all the Jewish tendencies. They were all Jewish people. One was a Hellenistic group, the other was a Hadistic group. And the Hellenistic Drew, uh, widows, pardon me, were being ignored, they felt, in the serving of food. And so the apostles went to the church and said, I want you to select from the church seven men from among you to help take care of the problem. So the apostles said, so that we wouldn't have to worry about it, so that we could devote our time to prayer and to preaching about the faith. They were busy. You remember, they didn't have the Bible at that time, so they were busy recalling the teaching of Jesus Christ and explaining how that fell in and how it worked in with the Old Testament, how it worked in with what the Christians were to believe. And so they said, select from yourself. Important because the church gets to choose from among them who this is going to be. And they selected these men according to the Scripture, and it says there that these were men of good reputation, full of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. These men then took care of the problem, uh, and according to Acts chapter 6, it says this, when they were called forth and they took care of the problem, it says this, the preaching about God flourished, and the number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. In other words, there was a lot of success. The, the church grew, the church was happier, uh, uh, the disciples were multiplied, and even these people who were Jewish priests turned over and came obedient to the faith. That's very important growth. And it all happened because the service in the church helped work together with the apostles to carry out what was needed. We see later on that not only here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that it had become an office. It wasn't simply something they did at that time, but it had become an official office within, or a, a station within the church. It's also mentioned, if you were to turn to Paul's letter in Philippians, as he addresses that letter in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers, and you remember we studied the overseers, that was the top of the rulers, the top of the elders, the overseers, we were talking about them being pastors today, and the deacons. And so there, when he writes to Philippi, those stations are already in place. Now, Deacons are found in all Christian churches today. As you go back and study those who are in the western part of the world and those who are in the eastern part of the world, those in the early churches and as we went on, we find them that there are deacons in all kinds of churches, whether they have what was called Episcopalian form of government, that's where there's a headship up here that governs down, or they have a congregational form of government, that's where the authority lies at the bottom and moves up. Now, uh, in certain churches, for example, the Roman Catholic Church or the Episcopal Churches or the uh, Anglican Church or the Methodist Churches, for example, a deacon is a person who has been set aside and is a, in a beginning phase of ministry. They are ordained, that is, set aside. They're set aside and they're ordained and they begin their ministry. And typically, in many places, they may stay in that role about two years and then they move on up to another level of ministry. And eventually, they move on farther into the, the, uh, the many levels there of priests and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, bishops and archbishops on up the line. But they start out here as deacons in those kinds of churches. Now, some of those are paid. They receive pay just like any called minister might receive. Some have both men and women in their diaconate. Obviously, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't. But in some churches, they do have women. For example, the Methodists do. Uh, now, some have that role, and they're considered part of the diaconate, which is what's called the group of deacons. Now, some churches see the deacon role as equal with the role of elder. But others, uh, and most others, the deacon is less director and more working servant, less a director administrator and more a working servant. Now, in Southern Baptist churches, deacons are elected by the congregation. They're nominated to the congregation. The congregation elects those. They're often ordained for a life or for a period of years, known about three years, although ordination is not actually a biblical 
We don't find that in the Bible. All we see in the Bible is where they are set aside for a purpose. And that's really what it means is to set them aside. But in Southern Baptist churches, in many of them, they do ordain. But in a, some of them, they don't ordain. these. They simply formally set them aside for God's work. Now, the work of these deacons ranges from things like ushering. You would find your ushers in the church, and they would be deacons. Or those who would work on building and grounds, they might be the ones who, everything from mowing the lawn to painting the building to repairing or getting the building repaired in some way. They, deacons are seen as those who help the pastor in ministering to the sick. In other words, to go and visit the sick or to help those who have suffered loss, the bereaved, or to visit on the homebound, those who can't attend the services, but they have someone, the deacons go by to visit them in their homebound situation. Uh, some deacons teach, some deacons involve themselves in outreach, evangelistic visitation, and often in financial administration in some churches, even though the church, they may not believe that they, they are equal with the, with the elders, they believe they still can work in areas of financial administration. Often in a church, you'll hear about a quote-unquote deacon board that is developed. Now, this is a group of deacons who assume leadership roles in the church over a period of time, even to what elders in some churches might have done. Now, in Baptist churches, the elders are considered, generally speaking, uh, those who are the call staff, the pastor or the uh, executive minister or the minister of the youth, those kind of things. Those are considered elders in, in many Southern Baptist churches. And then they don't have another group of elders, although that's beginning to change a little. But they do have this group of deacons. And the deacons may feel it necessary to take on leadership roles because, after all, in many Southern Baptist churches, when pastors come in, they only stay a certain period of time. I remember back when they only stayed about three years. Now it's kind of up to about five years. Uh, and some stay much longer. I've been at this church for 20 years. And before that, I was at a church for 16 years. But because pastors often come and don't stay all that long and go, when they leave, they leave behind a congregation and, and the elders are recognized as those leaders who are behind. And they can eventually become a very powerful group of people so that whenever they call a pastor, the pastor some has to, somehow has to deal with the deacons, not as helpmates, but sometimes as overseers. In other words, they would become the ones who would oversee the work of the pastor. That's nowhere found in the Bible in any place. But it has gotten into that now in some Southern Baptist churches because deacons move around so often. Many pastors value their support. I know uh, pastors who say to me, oh, I couldn't make it without my, my deacons who come and pray with me and stand with me and give me counsel. And I understand that. That's a great thing. I've been in churches where they had deacons like that and some where they did not have deacons like that. In other cases, sometimes deacons get a bad name among pastors because they, they tend to stymie the overseer's role. In other words, they make the, the overseer uh, who is the pastor or someone feel like that they must be accountable to the deacons rather than to the church as a whole. The church most often has to determine what is going to be the role and the authority that is granted to their deacon body. Then that can come about through a variety of ways. Move to a second point this morning. The biblical qualifications, in fact, what it says here in 1 Timothy and over in Titus, are the qualifications for someone becoming a deacon in a church. We begin in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. It says deacons, and by the way, it first starts out talking about overseers or episcopals and what their qualities are. Now it moves to verse 8 and it says deacons likewise, in other words, like the overseers, should be worthy of respect. That means someone who lives a life of recognizable character that is seen as a positive individual who respects other people and causes other people to respect them. Worthy of respect. This is a person that is high, has a high standing within the church and outside the church as well. It goes and says, not hypocritical. You know, someone who's hypocritical or double-tongued, it may say in some of your versions, that means this is someone who says one thing and does something else, or they tell you something on one hand and they lie to you on the other. It means that they are to live out who they claim to be. They are not to claim to be uh, godly people on Sunday, but on Friday night, they're very ungodly. Or they're not to uh, call themselves Christian servants on uh, during a worship service, but then later on when they're down at the ball game or out somewhere at uh, eating dinner that they be, be, they behave themselves 
like spoiled people. They are to be not hypocritical, not claiming one thing and doing another. Someone who's not a hypocrite is someone you can trust because they're honest and they are a good example. Third, it says they are not drinking a lot of wine. You remember when we talked about overseers, it said not addicted to wine. Here it says very similar, but it says not drinking a lot of wine. That means these are not people who give themselves easy, easily over something that would uh, control their minds in, in a wrong way. They're not addictive, some kind of addictive substance that would cause them to become confused or, or, or they speed up or slow down. Uh, they're not given to this foolish behavior that is created by these addictive substances. They're very moderate in even drinking wine. Now, in those days, folks, people drank wine because the water was so bad that they would they would tone that wine down to two, two uh, dashes of wine to three dashes of water was very common, and they would drink it like that. But this would be someone who might drink wine with their meal, like in that kind of combination, but they would not drink much of it otherwise. It goes on and says this, the deacon is someone who is not greedy for money. Now, yours may say not someone who uh, lusts after filthy lucre. It just means they don't want, they're not there to gain money. It doesn't mean you can't have wealthy deacons. That's not what it means. It means you don't want someone who is a deacon who uses whatever position they find themselves in any way they can so that they can gain money. You remember in the 12 who followed Jesus Christ, there was one that was Judas Iscariot. And Judas Iscariot's main trait was that he carried the money bag for Jesus and the disciples, and he was a greedy man. He would steal from it off, use it for his own means. We're not to be, in any case, when we serve the church, greedy for money. Now, as I said, you might have someone in your church who is a deacon who also is a great realtor and has a lot of money, or some may own a, a car dealership, has a lot of money. All of that's one thing, but if their heart is set on gaining money, that's a major factor, they ought not serve as a deacon in the church. Next, it goes on and says that the deacon is also is one who holds the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, folks, you'll see that often in the scripture. What that means is this. They believe in the gospel. They believe that God came to earth as Jesus Christ in the flesh, who lived among us, who taught us, who then gave his life, died on the cross. Literally, he was God as man who gave his life on the cross and then was resurrected again and ascended into heaven and filled our lives with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what it means. It means to believe in that not as a hypocrite, as we've already said, or not as someone who doesn't really understand it, but someone who says, in all that I know in myself, it's what I believe. I'm holding to that. I'm doing what I can to it. And Lord, let me stay steady. That's what it means right there. They hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And it goes on and says this in verse 10. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Now, what this means is that you don't take them out. You don't give them quizzes. Although today, I don't know, I see a lot of churches giving personality tests to help people know where they fit in. I'm not certain that's a good idea. Uh, I'm not saying it's not, but I'm just not certain about it. I will say this, though. The way you test a person for a role as a deacon is when they come into the church, you give them a period of time when they're not uh, put into a position directly. Now, they still work around the church. They still take on tasks that they find. You watch them to see if they measure up to these qualifications that have been mentioned. And as you watch them, you listen to them, you pay attention and see if they work for the Lord, if they hold the faith in good conscience. And if they do, it says if they prove blameless, which means you can't find some way to accuse them in any of these things, then it says they can serve as deacons. That's why in most of our positions, most churches, you can't become a deacon immediately. You join the church. Normally, it takes you a period of time. Uh, in some churches, it's a matter of years, two or three years before you can serve as a deacon. Some even longer. Now, there are some that are shorter. It depends sometimes on the size of the church and their needs, but it's not easy to get into this position. That's why so many people who do get into it are proud of it later on because it speaks well of them. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. Now, I'm going to skip verse 11 right here because verse 11 talks about women. I'll come back to that in a moment. And down, go on down to verse 12 right here. In verse 12, it says that, that a deacon is someone who uh, is the husband of one wife. You remember it said the same thing back when we were talking about the overseers. 
What that literally says is a one woman man. And it means that they cannot be polygamous. They cannot have several wives at one time, all that. Because in their heart, they are someone who has to be able and willing to devote themselves to a single woman. Now, that doesn't mean they have to be married. It means they are not a person who is a womanizer, not someone who would use their position in the church to, to uh, betray or to hurt women who come. To, but women come to the church leaders often to seek counsel, to seek comfort, to, to know where they're at. And it would be easy to use your position wrongly. And so you don't want someone that has that kind of uh, mindset. That means to be a husband of one wife, faithful when it comes to women, faithful in marriage if they're married, and not a womanizer. Next, it says they must manage their household or their children and their households well. Simply put, they have to be someone, if someone manages your household, if this is a good father, good husband, that would be someone who is reasonable, who is loving and acts out of love, who is honored because they deserve to be honored, who is obeyed because they teach you how to obey, they teach you what needs to be done, and you know that they love you for it, always seeking positive order and growth in family life. Not someone who's negative and overbearing in their life, but someone who is seeking positive order and growth in family life. A deacon is to be that, just as the head of a household ought to be that. Now, I'll go back. As I've looked at that right now, I want to go back now to verse 11, and I'll tell you why I skipped it. In verse 11, it says, uh, uses the Greek term right there, gunaikos. Now, that word, gune, which means a woman or a wife, it can actually be uh, interpreted either as a wife or a woman. That Greek term can be translated either way. Some scholars insist that it's placed in here along with the other deacon stuff because it is speaking to the wives of deacons who would impact their husband's attitude and character and perhaps, in some cases, play ministerial counterparts. Ministerial counterparts. Now, often, or other scholars insist that it refers to an office of female deacons or deaconesses. Now, the word deaconess is not used there, but a female deacon or deaconess. If you were to turn back in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, Paul is writing there to the church at Rome, and he starts that chapter by saying, I commend you, and, and it, probably he's speaking here about the person who brought the letter to the church. He says, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon of the church at Sincrea. And so right there, he refers to her. Now, as I said, that term can be interpreted in English as a servant, but it is the same term used here as a deacon. And in any case, if they are, and he gives qualifications for these people as well, he says they must be worthy of respect. Well, that's what it said earlier about the male deacons. They must be worthy of respect. They must not be slanderers. And that word slander right there is diabolus, which is literally means, uh, it comes from the root word diabolos, which means the devil. We know that term, the devil. And the devil, you know, is one who lies. He is the father of lies. And he accuses. He's an accuser. What he does is he, when he hears things about someone or knows something about someone, he slants it into a lie so that it slanders on someone's character, makes someone, accuses them, not even to their face, but behind their back, accuses them of wrongdoing. Now, uh, women are warned not to gossip. They're not to accuse anyone with a critical tongue. You know, all through the scripture, when you, when you hear uh, it gives instruction to women, it very often talks about their speech, the way they carry themselves in speaking, and whether or not they are gossips or murmurers and all those kind of things. And it tells them not to be that. That's true if a woman is either the wife of a deacon or serves as a female deaconess. It goes on and says they have to be self-controlled. That means able to think before acting, slow to anger, considerate of what might be the best form of action. The, the woman has this position or this role, has to be someone who is able to not let their tongue run away with them, not act too hastily, not be critical, not be mean, but control of their uh, of their abilities and their reasonableness. And then it goes on and says they must be faithful in everything. That means they must have a loyal diligence. You know what it means to be a loyal diligence? That means uh, determined to do the right thing and get it done. This is someone who is willing to take up work. And as the scripture says, we are to work as though unto the Lord. Well, that's what this means. 
This is someone when they do the work, they're not thinking about who's going to applaud for them or who's going to give them money. It's not any of that. It is someone who says, I want to please God. I am a faithful, a faithful in everything. And that's what this person is. Now, each church has to determine whether they believe that's a female deacon or a deaconess or if it's a wife of those who are deacons. In either, either case, it's a woman who turns to be a helpful, good woman. And likely, women were also used to teach and to minister to other women, which would have been improper in the first century. Today, you'll see women that, that teach and they're, they're deaconesses and they minister. However, some scholars think that Early baptisms were attended to by the deacons, at first the apostles, then later on by the deacons. And the deacons would often baptize, men would baptize men, and women would baptize women. There's a number of reasons. In some cases, they, they believe that in some situations, sometimes the candidate for baptism was baptized naked, so that it was a uh, washing away of sin, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, comparable to that idea, pardon me. And then, if that were true, obviously the women would have to be baptized separately in another place, the men in another place. In any case, uh, women would, were often the ones who attended to women because back there, folks, it was very, they were very separated. It was not customary or common at all for men and women to do things together. They were separated, especially in public places. And so it's highly likely that there were women back there who were working. They could have been the wives of men, deacons, but they were still working with women. In Titus chapter 2, in Titus, Paul is also gives qualifications there for overseers and, in, and, and deacons. In Titus chapter 2, Paul speaks. He doesn't use the word deacon, but he speaks to the service of women in the church, saying this, Older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers. See, we get back to that. Not addicted to much wine, which is what was talking about deacons in this place. They are to teach what is good. In fact, it goes on to say that older women are to teach younger women how to love their husbands. That's how important this is. Now, in that case, the word deacon, as I said, is not mentioned, but clearly the qualifications indicate a very common relationship. Verse 13 of our text here says this, Those who have endured well uh, as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith, that is, in Christ Jesus. If you serve the church... As an elected person set aside for service with a clear purpose and with diligence, you will be considered a person of honor and faith. God gives you that promise. God says, look, if you serve well, you do the right thing, you will be honored, you will be considered faithful, worthy to be heard. Someone will listen to you. And with a, and it goes on and says, and bold, isn't that something? Bold in the faith. And it means you have a strong assurance and joy in your devotion to the Lord and that you have great security in him that will come along with your service. That means it's a good thing to have and to be a part of. Now I'm going to take you uh, to our current church practice today. Our church does it just a little bit differently, but there are reasons, and I'll explain those. In our church, we do have deacons, but we do not call them deacons. Now there's a reason for that. I'll try to refer to it in a moment. We use the English translation, servants or servant workers. They make up our entire church workforce. They, men and women, are elected by the church to serve for a specified number of years. Uh, typically, it'd be a, up per year. In fact, we'll vote on our, in, in this December, we will vote on our uh, workers for the upcoming year. They'll serve that year. Now, some positions, take, they are in there for a longer position of time, three years or something. Those positions include things like building and grounds director who takes care of our our lawns and our flowers and trees and, and then the other, our, our building itself. We have some that will serve in roles of, uh, uh, for example, they might help in the kitchen. They might help take care of uh, making sure that the, the sanctuary is all clean and all those different kind of things that can be taken care of. They can serve. They help serve in the Lord's Supper. They can help serve uh, and teach different ages in the church. We adhere to the qualifications of our text as close as possible. Now, now, you know, sometimes it's hard to know, but we give time and we watch and we try to choose people that can do this task with a, this godly attitude mentioned here. And also we draw from Acts 6, where I mentioned a moment ago, where it says these are people who were reverent and they were 
a respectful, and they had the full of the Holy Spirit. And we try to choose those people that do this. Now, we do not officially, as I said earlier, ordain them because ordination is not something you're going to find in the Bible uh, that is used. It is a term that we use uh, where we use a ceremony and, and we set people aside. All, when we're ordaining them, we're setting them aside for life, for their task. Well, we don't ordain them, but they are recognized as chosen servants of the Lord for the work of the church. They are only servants slash deacons, if you will, for as long as they serve. In some places, you can be a deacon in a church and you get you serve for three years and then you take time off for another three years or even longer. I know people who haven't served in some churches for a long, long time and they're still deacons. Folks, we don't do that. You can only be a deacon or a servant as long as you serve. Whenever you quit serving in our church, you quit the position of being a church servant or deacon. We do not, oh, now we do use ad hoc groups, for example, ad hoc committees. For example, we had a pastor search committee. That would be an ad hoc committee. That's a committee that serves only for a period of time. In that case, tempor temporary workers would be needed, and they would be considered in our church servant workers or deacons in our church. And that's what we use in our church. The Servants Council, which our church has, which is a group that meets together and helps administer for the body and takes everything to the body for business meetings. The Servants Council is the administrative branch of our group that you would know as deacons. Why do we do this? Well, first, because it adheres to the biblical process. It allows both men and women to participate. Now, folks, I don't care if you say we don't have women deacons. We don't listen to me. I don't know of a single church out there that women don't take on a full load of work. They work all over. I, I know more women that do uh, service work in the church than men. It ought not be that way, but it is. And you may say, well, we're not going to give them the title of deacon. That's one of the reasons we don't use that title in our church. But we consider them still to be, uh, they're not ordained, they're not deacons, but they are servant workers in our church. It requires service to be a servant. You have to be serving to have that position. As stated, it's a process that we use that allows for the development of any form of servant group. For example, if the church, our church, felt like it needed an all-male group who would assist the pastor or to help in other areas, the church in this process can create that group if they feel that's necessary, if it serves the church better. A deacon board could be created if it was deemed necessary for the well-being of the body. But those kind of groups are not necessarily ongoing unless the church body agrees to do that and the need continues. Thus, in our case, the church controls the deacons rather than the deacons controlling the church. We found out that is the more biblical, the better way. In some churches, the deacons take over and try to rule the church. And folks, that doesn't work biblically very well. And it always creates problems, I've found, in lots of cases. I would say instead, the church is the one who uh, selects the deacons for the job at, the, at hand, and those deacons then serve the church. That, uh, that creates another reason we do it, and that is it works. When I, when I first ran across this, it wasn't me that wanted to do it. It was some deacons and some wives that wanted to check out doing it a different way because they'd had so much trouble. We spent a year and a half studying it. We came along and do this now. It works as long as the group is ruled by humility and diligence. As long as the people come in, just like it's talking about servants, are deacons, and they rule with diligence and humility, they prevent power struggles, and they prevent those people we might call deacons who do not deep. Servants who do not serve. And so it works great. If we need to uh, pull it in more forms, we're able to do that. All of this. Now, you have to choose how your church does it, but that's how our church does it. Now, let me conclude all this quickly. The Bible teaches that there are at least two levels of what we would call servant leaders in the church. The first is uh, are those called elders. Elders generally work in administrative roles. In Southern Baptist, it is the pastor and those who work on the ministerial staff, the call people, who are considered elders in the church. They, now, the persons or person in charge 
of that group and then in charge of the, of the church as far as uh, working for the church and for their good is what we call the overseer, the episcopos, the overseer, who is, if you want to use the term, is the head elder, so to speak, what it means. Southern Baptists have that. Usually that's the lead pastor in the church. Others of these elders might be incorporated, for example, into financial matters, and those kind of things. The second group is what we've been talking about today, which are, are those called deacons or servant workers in the church. They attend to the labor that allows the church to function without major interruptions. The church moves forward smoothly. It does what it's supposed to do smoothly, and it gets the work done smoothly. These are elected by the body. Uh, I, as the pastor, don't elect them. I may suggest to someone or ask someone, but the church is the one who elects the, uh, during a regular session, elects the people to, they are lay people who, who come and work so they can free up pastoral workers so that the pastoral workers can be absorbed in their teaching and their preaching and their praying and their spiritual, be, being spiritual mentors. The church seems free to use these two groups as necessary. Remember in Acts 6, the church was the one, the apostles said, you select from yourself. By the time we get to Timothy, we're seeing that it's a common practice. I would say to you that the church has freedom following the biblical guidelines and the qualifications and adapting those to the current needs of the church. The qualifications won't change, but the work might change according to what is necessary and needed in the church today. We need deacons. We need good deacons because, folks, as I said, they are servants, and we must all learn to serve the Lord within the body in which God has placed us. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you for the scripture tonight. I pray that you'd bless us as a church with our workers, that they might find their place, that they might serve. Lord, that they might work out of their spiritual gifts and they might free up the church so that we have the freedom, the opportunity, and the time and to do all that you've called us to do. I pray your blessings on our, our deacons, our servants that you would cause them to multiply and to be strong and to grow close to you. I pray not only for our group, Lord, I pray for every deacon and every church that's out there, that they might truly be servants, that they might not look to simply attain to a title or attain to some office or some position, but, Lord, that they might attain to what the title says about them, that they are to be servants for the body of Christ. I pray that. And I pray, Lord, that they might, out of that, be blessed as they come boldly to you by being accepted by the church body and fully secured and knowing they are secured by your hand. Bless us now as we go our different ways that we might serve you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening this morning. We'll be seeing you again Wednesday night for a Wednesday evening meal. And then next Sunday, we'll see you again here at Fruitland Road Country Church. We're glad to have you. I'm Dan Masters. Bye-bye.